In this video, we're going to talk about the only depolarizing neuromuscular blocker that's out in the market today, and that is succinylcholine. Succinylcholine. So, as we mentioned in the last video, it is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So, it is a depolarizer. And we can tell that it's a depolarizer if we look at the structure of succinylcholine. So the structure is 2-acetylcholine, which I'll abbreviate as ACH. So two acetylcholine molecules joined together. It's pretty simple. So that is the chemical structure of succinylcholine. And what's review what happens when succinylcholine binds to its nicotinic receptors. So you have this action potential causing release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. That acetylcholine is not going to bind because you have the succinylcholine uh, the succinylcholine that's out into gets out into the synaptic uh, or the neuromuscular junction. And what the succinylcholine does is it ends up binding to, uh, to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And that activates, that activates the influx of sodium. These gates, uh, the sodium-gated ion channel opens up. So these gates open up allows sodium to enter through into the cell, and that eventually leads to muscle contraction. So as a basic overview of how succinylcholine works, but the contraction is not relaxation. So how does succinylcholine relax the muscles? So you have this action, uh, or action potential propagation, muscle contraction. Eventually you'll have this, which I'll draw in white, and I kind of started by drawing it here. You have this time dependent, time dependent, time dependent gate. This lower gate is time dependent. Eventually, it'll close off after a brief period of time, and that will result in a cessation of all of this stuff and eventually lead to relaxation. That is the phase one block that we talked about. Phase one block. So that is the mechanism of action of succinylcholine. The, let's talk about the dose that you would administer succinylcholine. It's anywhere from one to one and a half milligrams per kilogram. And you, give, you can give it IV. You can also give it intramuscularly. The onset, the onset of succinylcholine is very rapid. So it takes effect in about 30 to 60 seconds. And the reason why it's so quick is because succinylcholine is very water soluble. Or or you can say it is uh, lipophobic, so it is afraid of fats. So that means that there's going to be a low volume of distribution that succinylcholine is going to uh, circulate in. It's not going to go anywhere where there's a fatty reservoir. It's going to stay in water soluble. It likes to be in a water watery environment. So that's why it takes a quick effect so quickly, and its duration. Its duration lasts about 10 minutes. And the we talked about it in the last video, the, um, the or actually we didn't talk about it in the last video. So we'll talk about succinylcholine's metabolism. How does it get metabolized? How does this duration, why is this duration only 10 minutes? Why isn't it 20 minutes or 30 minutes? Well, that's because succinylcholine gets broken down by 
and I'm going to do a little bit of personification here. There is this enzyme, I'll draw some eyes too, there's this enzyme called pseudocholinesterase. Pseudocholinesterase. And what pseudocholinesterase does, it takes the acetylcholine, or the, sorry, it takes the succinylcholine, which is two acetylcholines uh, that are connected to each other, and it breaks them down. It breaks them down into succinyl monocholine. So it ends up just breaking, breaking them down. This pseudocholinesterase enzyme is very effective um, at breaking down acetyl at breaking down succinylcholine. And what's interesting is that some people can have genetically different variants of this pseudocholinesterase enzyme. And the pseudocholinesterase enzyme, the, the genotypes are, if you remember back from genetics, you can have a um, you can have a homozygous. So let's just call it big P, big P for pseudocholinesterase. You can have a heterozygous, big P, little p, and you can have a little p, little p. You can have a homozygous, atypical variant. This is, it's not dominant, it's not recessive. I'm just talking about, um, I'm just putting labeling them like this just for simplicity's sake. So you have a homozygous uh, normal type, you have a heterozygous variant, and you have an atypical homozygous variant. And what happens is that the duration of, suc of succinylcholine depends on which variant you have. So there are some patients that have this atypical heterozygous. I'm just going to draw a little bit abnormal. So you see it's a little bit more abnormal. And what that's going to do is it's not going to be as effective in breaking down the succinylcholine in your neuromuscular blocking agent. It's not going to be as effective at breaking it down. So you are going to have a prolongation, prolongs, the block. You can have a prolongation of neuromuscular blockade. The heterozygous variant prolongs the blockade by about 20 minutes. The homozygous atypical variant, and let's just draw this kind of mess of an enzyme. So you can kind of imagine it's not really not really gonna work. That will prolong the block, but it won't prolong it for, you know, 40 or 60 minutes. It'll prolong the block for about four to six hours. So some patients have this, it's rarer, but some patients have this atypical pseudocholinesterase variant. So you, you want to be sure if a patient is, is paralyzed for a longer time than you'd expect, you know, you, you would have to have this abnormal pseudocholinesterase deficiency on your, or enzyme on your differential. And the way that you can tell, you can quantitatively, or sorry, you can qualitatively tell uh, if someone is a variant by administering this local anesthetic called dibucane. Dibucane ends up inhibiting pseudocholinesterase. It inhibits normal pseudocholinesterase way more than the abnormal pseudocholinesterases. So much so that if you give dibucane in a normal pseudocholinesterase patient, you will see an 80% an 80% decrease in activity of the pseudocholinesterase. If you give dibucane to a heterozygous a typical variant, you will see a decrease in the pseudocholinesterase activity of about 40 to 60 percent. And if you give dibucane to this abnormal atypical homozygous variant, 
you will see a decrease in the pseudocolonesterase activity by only about 20%. So it's not as effective. So you can tell by these numbers, um, when you do the dibucane test, it'll spit out a dibucane number. And that correlates with the percentages. And in the next video, we'll talk about the uh, implications of succinylcholine, its pharmacodynamics. But just to review, succinylcholine is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent. It's two acetylcholine molecules combined together. It uh, is an agonist at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, causing a phase one block after contraction, then relaxation. You can give about one milligram per, per kilogram IV. Its onset is very quick, less than a minute, thanks to its low volume of distribution because it's, li it's uh, lipid insoluble, it's water soluble. And its duration lasts 10 minutes, thanks to pseudocolonesterase. You can have abnormal variants of pseudocolonesterase, and the more abnormal, the homozygous atypical prolongs your block the most. And you can tell which type of variants patients have by using their dibucane number. The lower the number, the more atypical, the more homozygous they are.